1,3 dioxalane is currently used as a solvent in products like coatings, adhesives, paint, paint stripper, and as a co-monomer in polyacetals. It has similarity to more common solvents, like tetrahydrofuran and 1,4 dioxane. 1,3 dioxalane is made from the simple building blocks paraformaldehyde and ethylene glycol, and it seemingly can also be made as a green solvent. So perhaps we will see more of it in the future. Currently, it isn't commonly used in the laboratory, though it can be used as a substitute for NMP, glycols, and aromatics. Adoption in chemistry is quite slow, so it could be a great substitute for many reactions. It's just that chemists like their standard solvents. There are some niche uses where it is used as a reagent to add it to carbonyls. Other than that, not so much. Either way, it is still a decent solvent. So in this video, I will be preparing 1,3-dioxalane. The synthesis is relatively simple, which is why I was surprised to see that there was no video on YouTube about it. I'm putting this out there so that everyone knows how to make 1,3-dioxalane. You're welcome. To get started, I set up a heating mantle, and I will use a 1 liter 3 neck flask. It's still a bit dirty from some tar that doesn't want to come off. But for the reaction, it doesn't really matter. And afterward, it will have cleaned my flask, so it's a double win. On the right, I attach a gas inlet tube that will reach into the liquid. On the left, a thermometer to keep track of the internal temperature. Then as the first reagent, I add in 560 ml of ethylene glycol, commonly found as antifreeze, and it is very cheap. I then attach a funnel, and while stirring, I add 150 grams of paraformaldehyde, which can just be bought online, and is also very cheap. It should be done in a very well ventilated area, because the dust is irritating. It's very fluffy, and decided to all fall out at once. Anyhow, I then remove the funnel, and attach a short path distillation apparatus. But a regular distillation setup is also fine. I also just use a slightly dirty receiving flask, which is also not a problem. I already started heating the mixture, and set the temperature of the mantle to 150C. Then to the gas inlet tube, I attach a sulfur dioxide generator, which is just a flask that I fill with sodium metabisulfite and then gradually drop concentrated sulfuric acid into it. But dilute acids and other acids are also fine. Later, I ended up changing the gas inlet adapter and the flask because I needed the joint adapter for my dropping funnel, of which I apparently only have one, but it works the same. Just make sure that the sulfur dioxide is bubbled through the liquid. Almost immediately after a tiny bit of sulfur dioxide was added, the mixture became transparent, because all the paraformaldehyde quickly converted to formaldehyde. When that happens, it also immediately starts to react, and a mixture of the product and water starts distilling over. Since it was late, I just left it to distill overnight, and bubble sulfur dioxide until it stopped by itself, without adding more. The amount of sodium metabisulfide that I added was just random. In literature, they mention 1.5 liters of sulfur dioxide per hour, which is quite little. In this reaction, formaldehyde is liberated from the paraformaldehyde, which reacts with ethylene glycol in the presence of acid generated by sulfur dioxide, to form 1,3-dioxalane and water. In more detail, first, sulfur dioxide reacts with trace amounts of water that is present in the ethylene glycol, as well as pretty much every solvent, to form sulfurous acid. Sulfurous acid does not exist in its free state, and dissociates into a proton and a bisulfide ion. Another way to generate a proton here, mentioned in literature, is by the formation of the ethylene glycol sulfur dioxide charge transfer complex, which can react with another ethylene glycol molecule to give up a proton, that can then be transferred to another molecule. For a weak charge transfer complex like this to dissociate requires a highly polar solution, as we have here, though this reaction is probably not very significant. You could also use another acid like phosphoric acid or p-toluene sulfonic acid, but all the literature was more than 100 years old and didn't state the yield, except for this one. But it seems that this method is supposed to be higher yielding. Then for the next reaction, I have drawn part of the paraformaldehyde polymer, which can depolymerize when one of the ethers is protonated. When that happens, the adjacent outer carbon undergoes nucleophilic attack from water, and the carbon-oxygen bond electrons move onto the oxygen to form a hydroxyl, splitting off the rest of the paraformaldehyde chain and forming a protonated methane diol intermediate. This intermediate is immediately deprotonated by another water molecule to form methane diol and restore the acid catalyst. Methane diol is the hydrated version of formaldehyde that is only stable in aqueous solutions. Since we have little water in this reaction mixture, it instantly dehydrates by splitting off water, forming formaldehyde. As we see, the acid catalyzed depolymerization of paraformaldehyde doesn't consume any water since paraformaldehyde is technically the polymer of methane diol, and not formaldehyde. We only need one water molecule to start the reaction, meaning that you can pretty much always depolymerize paraformaldehyde with an acid in organic solutions that have trace amounts of water. When we have free formaldehyde, it is protonated by the acid, 
and the resulting oxocarbidium carbon undergoes nucleophilic attack from the hydroxyl of ethyl glycol. In the resulting protonated intermediate, the proton moves from the ether to the nearest hydroxyl, as that is more favorable. The other hydroxyl then wraps around and attacks the carbon adjacent to the protonated hydroxyl, which is kicked off as water. We are then left with a protonated 1,3-dioxalane, which is deprotonated by another or the same water molecule, restoring the acid catalyst and giving the final product 1,3-dioxalane. When I come back the next day, it is still distilling slowly, so I increase the temperature and insulate the top with some cotton. I also remove the gas inlet and don't add any more sulfur dioxide. Some hours later, a bit more has been distilled over, and it seems to be mostly finished. If you track via the thermometer, the distillate up to 103 degrees Celsius should be collected, and the reaction should be stopped when the internal temperature is 164 C, though I stopped it a bit earlier. I dismantled the setup, and the distilling flask is letting off a lot of vapors, including very irritating sulfur dioxide. So I cool it down and dilute it by adding a bunch of water, and I then poured it down the drain, and washed it with more water, giving back my clean flask. So the reaction helped me to remove the tar, which is also why the solution was yellow. Note that it will still let off some irritating sulfur dioxide if you pour it, and sulfur dioxide is one of the worst, so have proper ventilation. Now coming back to the distillate, which is a mixture of water, 1,3-dioxalane, and some impurities. It is also completely saturated with sulfur dioxide. We can destroy the sulfur dioxide by adding potassium carbonate, and at the same time, it causes the water and 1,3-dioxalane to separate, because the water will dissolve the salts and kick out the dioxalane. At first, not much happened, and I thought it was very slow and tame, so I added more, but a little bit too much came out of the container, and it started to party. Hit the like button for this dioxalane fountain. Overall, it was pretty contained, be more patient than me. Now I keep adding potassium carbonate until it no longer bubbles, and I make sure that the bottom water layer is fully saturated with potassium carbonate, so that all the dioxalane separates out. Normally dioxalane is more dense than water, so it would be on the bottom. But now, the dissolved salts increase the density of the water, so the dioxalane will be on top. I move this mixture to a separatory funnel, and drain off most of the water layer, and discard it. I collect the 1,3-dioxalane in a beaker, to which I add some sodium sulfate, which will absorb remaining droplets of water. I then set up a flask in a heating mantle, and filter the dry dioxalane through some cotton. I hold the funnel up so that the air can move, and I then add a stir bar. Now I set this up for distillation, to distill off all of the dioxalane, which has a boiling point of 74 C. The first bit that distills over, I discard, since it likely contains impurities, and it smells more like acetaldehyde. I then keep collecting the distillate around 74C, and it steadily comes over. When it pretty much stops coming over, some liquid that doesn't distill at this temperature is left behind, which might be impurities from the reaction or some ethylene glycol that had distilled over. I take the flask containing the 1,3-dioxalane, and the yield turned out to be 273 grams, which is 74%. This is a pretty decent yield and the reaction is not dirty at all compared to something like a dioxane or diethyl ether synthesis. The literature had a yield of 85%, but I didn't run the reaction until the temperature they mentioned, and I didn't supply sulfur dioxide constantly. Also, I probably lost some with the splashing. Overall, it seems that the literature procedure works very well. Now I did a calculation to see how cheap it really is. This is what the reagents cost me, and how much I used, which totals a cost of 5 euros and 28 cents. That makes the dioxalane cost about 20 euro per liter which is cheaper than the online sources that I can find. Anyhow, that was it. See ya.